Hi everyone, it's Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. In this video, what I wanted to do was to give a very short uh, description of something I've been getting a lot of questions about from people. Um, Gibson's conception idea of the uh, ambient optic array, right? Um, his idea of ecological optics. And this is really getting into how Gibson completely transformed the idea of what what's going on in vision and more, more broadly perception, right? So he changed the whole game, right, of what the perceptual system is trying to achieve. And I talked a little bit about this when looking at Bill Warren's article, you know, perception as an ill-posed problem and turning it to a well-posed problem is what Gibson did. So let's let's dive into this a little bit more, right? So the paper, if you want to get into this, you know, the paper where it's kind of this all started is a paper published in Vision Research in 1961 by Gibson, where he talked about the concept of ecological optics, right? So what are we talking about here, right? So the traditional view of what your, eye, your visual system is doing and what your perceptual system more broadly are doing is our eyes are optical instruments that are, rep, you know, they're registering electrical activity, right? So they have photoreceptors that are produce electrical signals when they're hit by light. So our eyes are getting all this electrical activity that's kind of from the environment, these light coming in, then they're sending it to the brain to figure out what the heck it is, right? To interpret it, right? Because we're getting all these things, we're picking up wavelengths and amplitudes and brightnesses and all these things of light that need to be interpreted. For Gibson, this is the wrong way to think about it, right? He, 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 his idea was that our eyes are not just passive optical instruments picking up these kind of abstract information, the abstract variables, then trying to interpret it later. Our eyes are more than just photoreceptors, right? They're more than just the retina, right? What we teach in traditional perception class. So this is a quote from Gibson. An eye proper enables its possessor to respond not only to light, but also to things from which the light is reflected. Just what does stimulate each such an eye? What is naturally adapted to register? To what is a sensitive considered as an organ instead of a mosaic of cells? Light is a much too simple of an answer, right? So Gibson's point here is that we're talking, we're treating it as this passive instrument just representing these abstract qualities from physics when it's a, a, a device, a system that evolved to control our actions, not just passively register energy, right? As, as we would with a, with a device, right? You know, we can get a light meter, like we're basically treating our, our perceptual system like a light meter, it's measuring the amount of light. Later on, we, we send it to a computer program to figure out what that means. For Gibson, this was the totally wrong way to think about it. So what he wanted to do was to change the way we talk about vision and, as I said, in perception in general, from talking about optics, which is talking about the physical properties of light, right, and the structure of light, to talking about what he called ecological optics, right? So um, physics deals with physical energy. Ecological is it going to deal with energy as it relates to our environment and how what we're trying to do with the light, right? Controlling our actions, right? That's Gibson's ecological optics. So it's putting the environment, the ecology, just like he did with ecological psychology into the, the story, right? Instead of just assuming abstract physical properties like you do in optics, right? So the key for this to Gibson, right? Was that the starting point for vision, right? Is not in the eye. It's not these electrical signals. It's not the, the things that are getting sent to the, the brain. The starting point for vision is in the environment, right? It's in this, what he called the ambient optic array, right? And the key point here that Gibson is making is that the light coming into our eye and we're coming into it, we're picking up, is not abstract, uninformative things that we need to reinterpret. It's already informative when it gets there, right? Because light comes from all directions, right? Which well, that's the term ambient, right? And it varies in intensity. It has an arrangement, right? So the key point Gibson was making is that the light arriving at our eye has already been structured by the environment it's traveled through. It's reflected off of it. That light has been changed by the environment. It's been altered right? So that's what he meant by array, arrangement. It's been structured in our environment. So when the light hits our eye, it's not these abstract physical things, just abstract physical things. It has 
information within it, right? That's his key point. So ambient coming from all directions, optic um, array meaning arrangement or structuring, okay? So what he believed is what we're detecting with our eye are not these physical properties, right? So our eyes are not designed to process wavelengths of light, which gives related to color, intensities, and so on, edges, detection, right? They're designed to process these structural properties that the, this structuring, this arrangement that the environment is doing for us, right? Transitions in light from light to dark, gradients in light from as a change, densities, different densities of brightness and darkness. So how the environment is structuring the light is going to give us information about what's out there, right? That's the basic idea. So the starting point, the stimulus for vision is not, is in the environment, okay? Not the in the head, in the retinal image. And it explains why, you know, different types of animals that have very, very different types of eyes without a fovea, for example, that can do high resolution vision can perform very, very similar, similar task, right? So that's his environment. So like anything, Gibson in ecological psychology, he's, he's making the story symmetric, right? We have to consider vision by looking at both the person and the environment, not just within the person, right? That's what, he, so not just being asymmetric uh, view of perception, right? So what is uh, also Gibson point out, and obviously it goes on to, this is very relevant for, for sports. Not only is the um, light coming to our eyes structured by the environment. So it's going to come into our eye differently, whether we're standing in the uphill or downhill, whether there's a, you know, um, two people in front of us and there's a gap or there's, <coughs> those people are together and there's no gap, right? It's structured by environment. The other key point he makes is that our movement through the environment, as I run around or approach or, or other objects movements, structures the environment further, right? So as I move through the environment, I change the angle the light's coming from. I accrete and delete, which means some of the things I could see before I can no longer see because they're blocked by other objects. We get optic flow. The, ob the light is moving across my eye at different rates and different amounts, right? So moving through our environment it even adds more structure to the to the light coming in, giving us more information, right? So the variables of the optic of light carry information about the environment. This structure, both from the light reflecting off the objects in the environment and how this changes as we move through the environment, gives us information. There's information there right from the start. We don't need to do some elaborate processing of it to get know what's out there, okay? And it quote Gibson, by carry information, I mean only that certain variables in an array, especially a moving array, will correspond to certain properties of edges, surface, things, places, events, animals, and the like. In short, to environmental facts. What he means by that is this patterns, these changes, these, these structuring is going to only be produced by one typical environmental feature, only one typical event, only time one typical property. Right? An uphill slope is not going to produce the same structure as a downhill slope, right? When I'm running so that I'm not going to stop in time to hit to avoid a collision, that's going to produce a different structuring of the light than if I am stopping in time. So this structuring, this arrangement of the light is creating facts. It's creating information, right? So examples of, so this is the idea of specification, right? We're, we're going on, there's information that specifies the variables we need to control our actions, right? And there's tons of examples uh, Gebson gives, you know, texture, right? Textures and uh, gradient, so how close objects appear together specifies their slope, whether right? we're going uphill, downhill, and so on, right? There's tons of examples Gibson gives of specification. Of course, as I've talked about, you know, in the episode where I introduced, I uh, reviewed Gibson's work, uh, don't have the number offhand, but I talked about invariance, right? Another important property along with the structure, along with how things change, is how things don't change, right? So certain things as we move through environment or the move around us are going to remain constant or invariant, right? While others will change. The variance in the optic array motions of objects of the individual, the invariants specify the permanent characteristics of the layout of the environment, right? So the important point there is that, yes, as I move around, things are, angles of changing, sizes of things are changing on my retina, right? But there's certain things that will remain 
invariant, right? So a good example of this is with approaching ball. Our approaching ball, no matter what size it is, what speed it is, what color it is, right? So all these changes, the rate of change of the size of the ball will tell you how, how long you have before it's going to hit you. That is an invariant property. No matter what else is going on in the world, right? What is changing in the light, that tells you an action-relevant property. It specifies time to contact, right? So that's a really, really important uh, concept, the environment. So Gibson's hypothesis, how Gibson revolutionized perception, and, and this is always the challenge with Gibson because his ideas were very, you know, on the surface, are really simple, right? Direct perception. I don't know how you can, everyone wants more processes, explanation. It, you can't, right? It's direct, right? There's not much more I can say. But the basic idea is if you break it down like this. So per perception is a function of information, right? So we're perceiving information. We're picking up action relevant information, not abstract qualities. We're not picking up wavelengths on. Information is the function of the environment. Our environment structures the light so that it creates information about it, right? It can create information about edges you could fall off, slopes that you need to climb, things you can sit on, balls you can intercept, so on. Therefore, perception is a function of the environment. We have this link, perception environmental link, right? We have to consider perception in terms of the environment, thus ecological ecology, psychology. So for his view, you know, the, for each perceptible property of the environment, an object, an event, you know, uh, action relevant variable like time to collision, there must be information that specifies it out there. Right? There's information because of the way the light is being structured, arranged in this array, there's information out there. If we're just attuned to it, just educate our attention to it, we can pick it up and control our actions without doing any other elaborate stuff in our head. Okay. So properties of the environment we use to control our actions are directly sensed, not inferred. Right. So again, there's no underlying processing or or, or internal or mental model or base, right? It's directly inferred. Right. And of course, there's other examples of information, specifying information that have been once well studied. Right. Uh, tau, um, how long do I have before that object will hit me? Right? I've talked about a lot, the time to collision, right? The rate of expansion of an object. Um, uh, so as an object moves for forward towards us, it structures the light by creating this expansion pattern that tells us when it's going to hit us. Focus of expansion. When I move through the environment, right? It structures the light, okay, uh, by creating this pattern of objects moving across my eye, right? And this pattern is such that there'll be no movement where I'm headed, which is called the focus of expansion, and the speed of movement will increase as I go out, right? So my behavior, my action, which I'm trying to control, is arranging, is structuring the light, right? Which is incredibly powerful, right? It's giving me information. So my action is creating information, right? It's a classic Gibson coupling. My action moving through the environment is creating information, which I use to control my action again. Right? Coupling, this cu coupling. Um, last one, you know, we've seen a uh, talk about on the podcast quite a bit is bearing angle, right? So if I want to try to intercept a, another person, a moving object, so uh, a baseball, I want to intercept a, a ball carrier in, in football. Um, I can use the bearing angle, right? So the angle between me and the person, um, if I keep run, if I adjust my behavior to keep that constant, I'll I'll tack, I'll arrive at the same position of that person, uh, no matter what the other um, things going on. So these are all exam, exam examples of invariance. So the key point here, the ecological optics is, again, Gibson's key point that we need to consider perception, action in the context of the environment in which it's situated right, in which it habit inhabits. When you do that, you see that the environment is giving us all this wealth of information by structuring the light, structuring the sounds, structuring, you know, that are coming to us, right? So we don't need to fetishize our brain as doing all the work for us with computational models and representations, right? Because the environment is giving us so much to us in the first place. All we have to do is focus on it and pay attention to it and pick and attune to these different sorts of information that are out there that we can use to control our actions. So hopefully this helped to understand a little bit about Gibson's ideas, right? They're really, like with all of his ideas, they're fundamentally very simple, 
but unbelievably profound and earth shattering um, if you really take them to heart. So uh, thanks for joining me. And, and if you can find, if you want to find out more, please uh, check out the information about the podcast at perceptionaction.com. As I mentioned, I have a bunch of other things that directly relate to this talking about Gibson's work. And I, I mentioned the Bill Warren article. So thanks and cheers for now.